All right, so um, this is an example with a, with a controller. And uh, normally, we, we would need to put those two requires at the top, right? Because this controller is inherited from application controller. So in a, you know, normally, in a Ruby library, standard Ruby library, you should need to require you know, the file that defines that, that, that class. And in the index action, we are using the post model. So normally, uh, we should be requiring post to have that, uh, you know, define it when the, when, the, when the action runs. But you know that in Rails, actually, you, don't, you do not need to do that. Indeed, this has a number of issues. First, it, it, look, it looks like kind of redundant, right? We have post and require post application controller. Our Ruby mind, uh, you know, quickly says there's something, you know, redundant here. We could maybe automate something or, or, or something like that. The other thing is that require requires the file only once. So if, if, if something changes, uh, it's not going to be reflected in memory, you know? And in development, we, we like to be able to change things and, and have them, you know, refreshed in memory automatically. So Rails pro, uh, provides this, this feature, which is constant autoloading and class reloading. And it's, it's one of, of my favorite um, features of, of Ruby on Rails. First, it's, it's something that is uh, focused on what I, I believe is the most important thing when you design software, which is uh, how do you use this, this you know? How do I use Rails? This is very convenient for me as a, as a programmer, as a Rails programmer, you know, to have this feature. So this helps a lot, you know, in your day-to-day. -day. It's, a, it's a key feature for me. Um, the other thing is that it's kind of, I don't know, it's kind of unassuming. You, you know, it's, it's just there it's silently doing its, its work, you know, I don't know. There's something there. And also it's technically interesting, I believe. So this is, the talk is about how this works. And it, it has three sections. The first section is a section about constants in Ruby. So that's going to be just Ruby. And that's because uh, this topic is, is a, a topic specifically about constants. And, and it's, it's going to be good that we have them fresh in our minds how they work in Ruby. So first, first section, constants in Ruby. Second section is how this, works, how this constant autoloading works. I refer po the post model, and it's just defined. It. So, indeed, the idea is that it's as, as if you had your application already loaded. You know, you, you don't have to care about that. It's, you can work more or less as if that was true. The third section is class reloading, because we have here two, actually two features. One, one is that the, the constant is auto-loaded for you, and the other one, Related but different is that, in addition to that, in development mode, uh, by default, the you know the, if you change something, that's refreshed in memory. That's that's uh, the third section. All right, so let's go with with the constant refresher. You know what's a constant in Ruby? We have here an assignment. X, uh, we we are assigning an integer to to the to the x constant. Uh, in most programming languages, constants. Are a, like a trivial topic. There's not there's not a lot a lot to say about constants, but surprisingly in Ruby, uh, it's a it's a really I don't know. It, it, there's a lot of, of, of things to say about constants. It's by far, it's, it's not by any means something you know uh, as simple as in other languages. Um, here we have a, a class definition. It looks innocent, but and here here's the point. This is this is a, a constant assignment indeed. We, don't, we do not see it because we have the class keyword and that, that's working behind the scenes. But there's a constant assignment there. So in reality, what happens is this. So the, 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 we have here three. I cannot use the laser, so I'm going to try to describe where, where I am. The, the first thing is class C. We, we are defining the class C as in the, in the previous slide. The second chunk is equivalent. Equivalent as, as far as constants is concerned. Then there's some stuff with the scope and some stuff that doesn't matter for, our, for, for this presentation. But if you define a class and assign that class to the C constant, 
that's the same thing the class keyword is doing, the same thing. I mean, this is, I'm not talking about the implementation. I'm talking about the conceptual model in Ruby. It's, it's that. So there's, when we say the C class, we are doing an abuse of language because the class is the object that it's stored in the C constant, like you could store it in a, vari in a variable, you know? So it's in, a, in, in the C constant. So Ruby has constants and has class and module objects. And they are independent, you know, uh, things of the language. When you define a class that way, uh, there's a little coupling there, and that's also, in addition, uh, you know, give it to you in a, in, a, in a simple way with a class keyword, you know. But once you get that definition, they are constant and class object stored in a constant, the same way we stored a one in the x constant in the previous slide. Same way. There's no difference. You have x storing one, you have c storing a class object. There's no difference. And here, if you ask in the third, in the third um, um, chunk of code, if we ask uh, for the name of this class, we get C as a name. And why? Let's suppose the first chunk does not exist, right? Let's suppose we have only the, the second and the third chart, uh, chunk. So the reason is that when you assign to a constant, the interpreter says if the object I am assigning is a class or module and it does not have a name, it's anonymous, then I am going to put the name according to the constant I am assigning the object to. That's what happens. That's like, you know, the, the code in the, the interpreter that does this, right? So you get, you get C as a name. And by the way, this name, this, this, this method call is calling a method on the object that it's stored in the C constant. This is one of the most important slides of the presentation. So what happens in the third chunk is that there's a, a C constant that is the same, you can think of a variable to, to separate clearly constants and class and module objects. There's a C con constant that evaluates to a class object that responds to a name method that yields a result. That's what is happening there. So when, when the, the interpreter boots, you have uh, a number of constants already defined, you know? But they are constants, they are not classes. So when, when we say the string class, and we r write it that way, we are doing an abuse of language. It's a, of course, it's a convenient abuse of language. You are not going to, to say, you know, give me the object that is stored in the string constant by default by interpreter, something like that which would be, you know, the whole thing. It's not, it's, not, it's not convenient. But that's really what's happening. We have a string constant that stores a class object that is created by the interpreter when you would. Constants are stored in modules. So, for instance, this is the, the uh, implementation of the module class in Robinius. You see, it has a constant table. You can think of that as a, as a hash table. It maps the name of the constants that that module has with the value. It's like, it's like a hash table. It's like a, like a symbol table, you know? So they are starting modules. And again, this is not implementation. This is the conceptual model in Ruby. Constants belong to modules, conceptually. So here, we are assigning one to the constant x. And What's happening there? The module, and I am going to spell everything now. That's not, that's not how you talk you know, in, your, in your everyday programming. But what happens here is the, we are assigning one to a constant called ex that is stored in the constant table of the module that is stored at that time in the constant m. We normally say x is stored in m, right? But to, to clarify everything, because one of the purposes, you know, 
w one of the things that we are going to have clear when, when we finish a talk is that, that this, there, they, these things are totally decoupled. So we are storing the X in the module that is stored within the M constant. Indeed, the module co could be called something else. And again, the class keyword and the module keyword are basically constant assignments. So this is something in the first chunk of code. This is something that we do routinely. Module something that creates a namespace for you, and you define a class in that namespace. All right? That's a constant assignment. All class and module keywords are creating constants for you. So it's equivalent to the second chunk. The second chunk creates a, a class with, with a constructor, class new, assigns to sax parser, and then if you ask for the name of this, of this class object, it returns XML colon colon sax parser. Why? Because it is storing the class object in a constant that belongs to a module, call it XML. Then the interpreter builds this XML colon colon thing for you, okay? Depending on the, on the name of the module, you are defining this thing. And this is another very important slide of this presentation because we are totally going to decouple constants and modules here. We have something similar to what we had before, but we are going to stress that the module and the constant are different things. So in the first chunk, we define a module XML, empty. All right. Then we do an assignment. This assignment, it's, it's very important. In, uh, if you want um, XML evaluates to a module object that we assign to another constant, same thing as if, as if XML contained a string or something more ordinary, you know? There's no difference. It's just an object that is stored in the constant. We assign that object to, uh, in this case, the, N, the, the M constant. All right, so after this uh, line, the M constant and, and the XML constant hold the same object. If then we reopen the M module, because in the, in the, in the third chunk we have module M, what does module M mean? So the interpreter says, okay, M, do you have an object? This constant exists? Yes, it has a module, all right. So since it has a module, it's going to reopen the module. It doesn't matter that it was called or assigned it initially to the XML constant. It doesn't matter that the name of the module is XML. It doesn't matter. It's a constant evaluates to a module. We are going to reopen the module. And if we define the SAX parser class inside that namespace, the name is still going to reflect the name of the module under which we are going to define this constant. You see the separation? So the XML ends in the name of the class because it doesn't matter which is the constant that you syntactically see in the scope. What matters is the module stored in that constant. Of course, this is something that, that we do not uh, do you know, in our everyday programming. But if we understand this example, we, we, we are able to distinguish and, and know what's going on, you know? Since modules store constants, we have an API to modify the constant tables of those modules. And that's this API that you maybe know, const get, const set, uh, const define it, et cetera. So that's like a high API. Get, get me this constant from this module. Do you have this constant, you know? All right. So to, in order to resolve constant names, Ruby has three algorithms. We are going to see the three of them uh, from the easiest one to the more complicated one. 
This is one is here, and it's kind of implicit. We maybe do not realize there's, uh, there's a constant lookup here. So we have a module, admin, and a user's controller uh, that we want to def uh, define uh, within the admin namespace or admin namespace. What happens here? Remember that every time you use the class or module keyword, the interpreter checks whether you are defining something or reopening something. So there's a check going on, you know? Ruby needs to check whether uh, user's controller is defined in, ad in, in admin module. I don't remember where goes the accent, admin or admin. Where goes? Admin? Admin, OK, thank you. So in the admin module. And it's only going to check the admin module exclusively. Even if, if it has ancestors, it doesn't matter. It's going to check the admin module, which is what the namespace we have in the scope. So if you, the constant user's controller exists in the admin module, it's going to, to check if it's a, a, a class and, I don't know, and reopen the class if it's a class. Otherwise, it's going to wear. All right. And this is very important. It's only going to check the admin module. So if you have a user's controller already defined in the top level scope, it, 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 it doesn't going to, to matter. It's not going to, you know, to reopen that top level thing. It's a strictly the module I have in the scope. All right. By the way, in the top level, constants are stored in the, in, in, in the object, right? OK, the second one. To, uh, to explain the second one, we need to, to revise the concept of ancestors of a module or, or class. OK, let's go through this slide. In the first chunk, we define an n module. In the second chunk, we define an M module that includes N. Then N becomes an ancestor of M. All right. Then we have class D. And finally, class C inherits from D and includes M. So we have a little bit of everything to, say, to, say, to, to see ancestors in all their generality, you know? So which are the ancestors of C? The, and you see, you see at the bottom the ancestors of C. So first C. So technically, the ancestors method returns the receiver. And in the present, in, in this in this presentation, I am going to refer sometimes to the ancestors. I am I am going not to include the receiver in that in that in that notion. You know, I'm ancestors uh, uh, from me up. You know, but the ancestors method returns the receiver. All right, then. M, then N, because N is an ancestor of M, you know? So it's kind of recursively, you know, uh, unnesting everything for you until it uh, gets flat. That's what it's, it's, it's doing. Then once you have, you know, recursively unnested everything uh, uh, regarding modules, including modules, uh, then it goes the superclass. And finally, if you, we have the rest of ancestors, you know, object, kernel, and finally, basic object in recent, in recent rubies. So these are the ancestors of, of a class or module. And this is the algorithm that is used to resolve this, uh, this uh, particular case. And we are talking about the X. So in this particular thing, we have two constants, M and then the x. The first m is not related to this algorithm we are explaining now. Let's suppose that, let's suppose that m is resolved somehow and gives you, for instance, a module. OK? So this slide is about how the x is resolved. And the way the x is resolved is checking m. Do you have the m in your constant table? Uh, let's suppose the answer is, is no then it's going to go through the ancestors of the M module. OK? Check in one by one. If you find the constant, it's going to return a, a value. Otherwise, it's going to exhaust the ancestors 
and is going to call a special method called cons missing. Cons missing is, is similar to meth missing. Like if, if, if you were asking for a constant and it, it was not found, you know, in the places that, that uh, uh, there's a lookup for, uh, it, that method is going to be called. And uh, Ruby has a cons missing definite module and that's, that's the method that raises a name error if the constant is not found. It's a, it's a method, indeed, which is racing with that, you know, error message that say that the constant didn't exist. So only checking the ancestors. And God's missing if it, if it fails. And now we go to the most complicated of the three, and, and the, also maybe the most uh, common one to use, which is in this situation... Uh, Oh, we, are, we are going to introduce the concept of nesting here also, which is important for the third algorithm. So um, we saw the ancestors. We are going now to see um, the nesting, and both of them are taking in, take it, uh, take it in, into account in the third algorithm. So the idea of nesting is that nesting reflects the, the nested namespaces you have at the point of execution. That, that's the idea, all right? So, in this case, we have M, N, C, okay? And if these constants store the modules that we normally have in those constants where the, the names match, we are going to, to have in module nesting, which is a method that tells you the nesting at, the, at a given point, uh, those, those three things, okay? The C class, it's M, M, M and C, the M, N module, and the M module. You know, that's the nesting. So it's, it's something syntactical. You see the source code, you see the nesting. Okay, it's syntactical. All right. At the top level, the nesting, it's empty. And it's important to say that the nesting is only changed by the module class, uh, sorry, the module uh, keyword, the class keyword, and then the eval family, let's say family, there are several eval methods or several or, or eval-like methods, uh, when they take a string of code to evaluate. Not when they take a block, but when they take a string, then the nesting is changed for the context of the evolution of the execution of that string. But that, that's, the, that's the only thing that changes the nesting. In particular, class eval and these kind of things, when they take a block, the nesting is not changed. And this is important for the resolution uh, of constants with relative names, which is what we are going to do now. So you see, in the third chunk of code, uh, module nesting, it has not changed. Still, it's empty. Even if for some other stuff, is the M and C class that is in a scope to define methods and, you know, for other things, that class is in a scope, but the nesting is not, is not, uh, that, that class is not pushed to the, to the nesting. All right. So what happens with this X in the middle of the screen? The algorithm goes this way. It checks whether X belongs to the, the class stored in the C constant. Let's suppose it doesn't exist there. It is going to go up to the nest, up following the nesting. So it's going first check C, then, well, the name is M, M, and C, but let's see, let, let's say it uh, simple. C, then the next module, MN, then the next module, M. Let's suppose it, it, it has not found the constant in any of these three things. Then it's going to follow the ancestor chain of the C class, M and C class. Okay, and then there's a special rule here. Um, with, this, with the C class, we are done. If, we, if a constant is not found, it's going to call, it's going to call const missing. But if the, if the namespace in a scope, the most nested you know, thing in the, in the, in the, in the nesting, uh, it's a module inst instead of a class, then uh, the interpreter manually checks object. Object does not belong to the, to, to the nesting, okay? So in, in the first thing, when, when, when we, we go up this way, it's a C and M, and 
stop there. We are going now to, to go through the ancestors of C. And we have not checked object yet. Object is the last resort. So if the most nested thing is a module, then there's a, there's a, there's a, a, a you know, an exception in, in, the, in, the, in the algorithm, um, a special rule that says we are going to check no object. All right, if it, foil, if it fails, it invokes cons missing. To simplify the, 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 these this, uh, descriptions of the algorithms, um, um, I skipped this little detail, but we now uh, are going to see it. You, you know this uh, kernel autoload thing? Kernel autoload um, allows you to define here um, a constant, sucks parcel, let's say, and uh, associate that with a, with a file, with a file name. What that does is, basically, the, the idea is to lazily load the constant when you need it. So when you need it means any time you try to do something with a, with a constant, get a value, ask if it's defined, something like that, transparently, the, the interpreter, if you, ask, if you are asking for that constant, is going to, to check if there's an autoload. And if there's an autoload, is going to fetch the file, and if the file defines the constant that we are expecting, it's going to return the value it holds. Okay? So every, in, in every, every single time I said it checks this module, it checks the ancestor, it checks, that check is always a check if there's defined, and if there's an autoload, go an autoload. All right? That's the entire, the entire algorithm. This is very important. I, I, I've been asked, it, asked it, uh, a few times this. Uh, the way constant autoloading works in Ruby and uh, in Rails, sorry, uh, is not based in, 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 in this autoload mechanism. It's, it's a different uh, uh, thing. The, the implementation we are going to see it has nothing to do with with uh, with this autoload feature. And the problem is that it's, 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 it's just not not possible. Uh, there are there are a few things with with this autoload thing. First thing is that it only it, it only accepts constant names. You cannot pass constant paths. All right? So that, that uh, introduces some stuff for, the, the, for some difficulties to support namespaces in Rails. The other thing is that it does a require. And in order to be able to, out, to reload things, we, we need to be able to, eject, to execute files when they change. So if you use require, uh, uh, you are not going to be able to trigger this again, you know? And in addition, you, you, could, you could decorate maybe, I don't know, as a hack, kernel require. But in addition to that, at, at least in, in MRI, that require is a particular required in C that is not kernel require. It, 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 it uses a particular required require, all right? Uh, still, you can do a hack with that, because how does require know if something was loaded? So there's, you know, there's an array, call it dollar double quote, that has the names of the files that that has been loaded so far. Require checks whether the, whether the file you want to load is there, and if it's there, uh, it does nothing. If it's not, require and it stores that, you know. So that array is mutable. So if we remove the string from the array, require is going to be full and is going to load again the file. OK. But it's not, it's not yet enough. Even if we did that hack, we had the, we had, we had the, the issues with namespaces. There's no, there's no API to remove an autoload, for instance. So, so if you remove a file that defines the user class or something, we would expect that to, I don't know, to not work. There, there should be no autoload for user, you know, but you, know, you cannot remove autoload that you already have defined. So there, there's a number of reasons um, that, uh, that prevents, prevents Rails from implementing autoloading with this thing. And it's a pity because it could be so transparent. It, it could be so smooth. I don't know. It, for me, it could be the ideal solution for constant autoloading. But... Uh, I don't think it's possible to implement it with, with this feature of Ruby. 
OK, so we are ready to go uh, for constant autoloading. The thing is, we are going to, to um, autoload the user constant. You know, in the, we, are, we, we have been invoked the action. Up to that point in the, in the execution of the code, the user model was not defined. And what happens? Ruby says, hey, you are accessing a user constant. I don't know anything about that constant. It looks for the constant in user's controller. It's not there. Admin is not there. Ancestor is not there. And what happens? It calls const missing. You know? And Rails defines a custom const missing. That, that, that's the key of this, of this feature, that const missing. So instead of the default const missing that just raises, we have a, a, a so const missing is a method. And the cons, cons, missing, cons missing is called doing a method dispatch, ordinary method dispatch. If you, in the ancestry, you have defined, you know, something in between, that one is the one is going to be invoked. So cons missing uh, gets the constant name you are looking for. In this case, uh, the constant name would be uh, user. And it's, uh, it's running in the context, you know, of the um, admin users controller um, class. And that's the information you have. You know, it was invoked in, use, in admin users controller. The name we are looking for is user. Those are the two bits of input we have. There's a, this, com, this configuration um, collection in, in, in Rails application that by default, it has everything under the app directory, di directory and it's, it's mutable. You can, you can add stuff uh, um, in that collection. That's a collection of, of directories to look for um, um, constants in autoloading. So it goes this way. First, it checks whether there's a user RV uh, below um, admin user controller. So is, is that file, do, uh, do that file exist? Pro probably there is not even a user's control directory, you know, but you check. Is this, this path exists in the file system? Let's suppose the answer is no. Next step, and this, this, is, this is a strange, but we are going to see uh, in a minute what it means. But let me, let me tell you that it checks also whether there's a user directory below the user's control directory. OK, let's suppose it doesn't exist. Then it goes one level up. And we are here kind of emulating going the, 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 the nesting up. So the nesting here is first admin user's controller, then admin. OK? So we are kind of checking like more or less like Ruby does. It's different, but it's more or less the idea. You know, this, this thing. Exists here? No. Next level. Exists here. That's why it checks whether there's an admin user RV. Let's suppose the answer is no. And also checks whether there's a, a, directory, a directory admin user. And if all of these checks fail, uh, if we have a user RV in, you know, at the top level, is going to load that one. And that's, that's the way a user RV is loaded. Okay, and in development mode, this is, this is done with load. You know, Ruby has require and has load. Require requires only once, load uh, loads every time you, you want to load a file. So in development mode, it's done with load, and in um, production mode, uh, it's done with require by default. The thing with directories is that Maybe you have noticed that when you have namespaces in a Rails application, you do not need to define a, 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 a file that defines by itself the module that you are using in the namespace, if it's a module. So here's an example. Let's say we have, we have uh, um, some workers. And let's say that for organi organizational purposes in our application, we have the workers in a workers directory. It's plural or singular? Singular. Worker directory. 
OK, worker directory is something, you know, files. Uh, maybe, you, maybe you have noticed that you do not need to define a worker.rb file that defines the, the worker module. You do not need to do that. You can do it, but it's not required. So the thing is, it's going to find, you know, doing this backtracking, it's going to eventually find the worker directory. And in that case, it builds an anonymous module for you. Well, anonymous first, and then, OK, let, let's explain this. It's going to, we're, we're going to match it with the with a, with a previous section. So we store a worker constant in object and assign uh, a module to that constant. And this is a constant assignment. It's a little bit convoluted. It goes through the API, but it's a constant assignment. So that module that it's anonymous is going to get the name of the constant we assign it to it. Ruby is going to do that for us. So when you, when you ask for the name of the worker module, it's going to say worker. OK, so Rails uh, does that for you. There are a few cases, few, I don't know, corner cases where you need, so this thing is, is lazy, right? And that's, and that's fine, that, that's good, because you are not evaluating files until, until you, need it. you need them. But there are a few, few cases where you, you need to be sure that the constant is defined by the, by the time, uh, by, uh, at some point in the code. And you can do that with required dependency. Require dependency basically says, load that file now, so, I will, so the constants are going to be defined now, but do it, it in a way that is integrated with all the system and they are going to be reloaded and everything, you know? Um, um, you, we do not have time to, to explain use cases for this, for this, but let me say that you need this rarely. So this is, this is something ex exceptional. Do not take it like normal, you know, normal API that you use every day. No, no, no. It's, it's only for some particular cases where you need to be sure that something is loaded at that time. So we keep, we keep track of fully qualified uh, staff and file names. Um, kernel, auto load, uh, kernel load and kernel require are rapid because if the user, if the user, uh, uh, if user RB requires no Kogiri, for instance, dependencies has to be able to know that user RB was something autoloaded, but no Kogiri was something not autoloaded. It needs to distinguish them because it needs to know what was autoloaded and what was not. Because, of course, the interpreter has tons of constants, you know? It's important to, to realize that constant autoloading in Rails is different. It uses different mechanisms than the, the, the Ruby, the Ruby uh, algorithms. First, const missing does not have the nesting. We have the name of the class, we have the constant, but we do not need in, in which of these situations we are because the nesting depends on the modules stored in the constants, not in the constant names. So the first, the first chunk of code is the regular one, but the, the, in the middle, the nesting only has one module, MN. Okay, so Rails is not, const missing is not able to, to say whether, the, which is the nesting. We, we, I know my name is MN, but MN is, is the name in the first chunk and in the second chunk. And there's no way to tell which of the both cases you are, you know? And we, th this is like very, very decoupled. I mean, you can build a nesting with any number of, 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 uh, of, 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 with any modules. So generally speaking, the nesting does not reflect the namespace. It has nothing to do with the names of the things. Of course, you normally do work with code that reflects it, but technically, it doesn't need to reflect anything. You, the nesting, nesting can be arbitrary as the third chunk uh, exemplifies. And, well, there are even uh, more corner cases, but we are running a, a, lot, a, a bit um, late, so I'm going to skip this one. So there's a trade-off. There's a trade-off. Rails is going to assume that the namespace 
you know, the name of the class reflects the nesting. It's going to assume that. If the code is not that way, it's not going to play by the rules of dependencies RV. That, that's the idea. So it's better, it, it flows better if, if, the, if your, na if your um, name spaces reflect the name of the things, okay? So this is the assumption we, that we are in this situation, all right? Rather, rather than doing class admin colon colon users controller. You can do that, it mostly works, but it doesn't flow naturally with dependencies RV. Let's forget about this, which is a, a corner case. The other, the other key, key information we, we do not have is which is the name of, which is the, the algorithm that was being used to load the constant. We have no fucking idea. We don't know. So um, here we do something that I don't like very much. I don't think this, uh, this is an elegant solution, but it's the best you can do. You cannot do anything else. We, we are going to check whether uh, the, okay, we do a check that says if this, if this check succeeds, uh, we, we, we kind of know which is the algorithm. But that check depends on the order of loading of the stuff, which are the constants that, that are defined at that point. I don't like it very much. Uh, third important uh, difference, uh, we didn't mention any ancestors. We only did like the, the, the directory thing, okay? Which is kind of following the nesting, but we didn't say anything about ancestors. And that's just because uh, we, we have seen no use case for doing that and complicating things, so uh, it doesn't do it. So this is a corollary of, of this part. Uh, uh, it doesn't emulate the way Ruby actually does things because we cannot. The, 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 inform, the key information is lacking. We do not have it. Okay, so quickly, the request flow. You know there's a flag that says whether you want to reload things and auto-load things. Uh, there's something that monitors whether the files uh, change. And there's a middleware if, if you want to reload stuff that is going to reload the stuff. Um, some stuff is watched if you change the routes, the routes, sorry. Uh, these changes, lo um, locales, and everything. And that's, that's, the, that's the key point. S if something changes in development mode in the file system, then the constants, we know, because we were, you know, we, we, we were keeping track of the constants that we autoloaded. Those constants, we just remove them. Rails removes those constants, like using the API. Remove cons, remove cons, remove cons, remove cons. That's done in the middleware before the, the, when we start doing the next request and we detect that something changed. So all constants, all autoload constants are removed. So the way reloading works is, this, is the following. If we change it a file and the constants are removed and we are in a request to that uh, admin users controller, what's going to happen? That when the interpreter arrives to the line with, that uses the user constant, says it doesn't exist, like it, like, like it said you know, in the previous request or whatever, you know, it doesn't exist, then therefore I'm going to go to, through, th uh, through these algorithms, I'm going to try to load it, and you get a new class object assigned to this constant that we just removed. It could be that the original, you know, technically, the original class object may be, you know, it could be floating somewhere, but it's not reachable through the constant anymore. In that, if, if, your, if your application, uh, you know, is, is correctly up, um, um, written, uh, there should be no, nothing referenced, you know, dangling, uh, um, you know, uh, in, the, in memory. But, they are decoupled. It could be, it could still be that the class object uh, were in some, um, somewhere living, and I've seen projects that had issues because uh, some stuff like this, they autoload the constant in initializers or in places that get not reloaded, that kind of things. Okay, anyway, that's it. All right, thank you.